Good afternoon. My name is Frank Clark and I'm the master of historic foodways here at Colonial Williamsburg. I'm here today to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, beer and brewing. Uh, malt liquors, as the 18th century terminology would have us. Uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of beer in English culture, uh, a little bit about the process of making beer, uh, and we're going to be answering your questions that you may have about beer and brewing and its use in the 18th century. So please be sure to uh, send us the questions that you have about beer and brewing, uh, and we'll be glad to address those as we go through uh, this afternoon's broadcast. So let's start off with talking a little bit about beer in English culture. Because of beer English climate and England's location geographically, uh, wine is not an easy produced beverage in England. Uh, they are much better at growing grain than they are at growing grapes. And as a result of this, uh, beer has long been a part of English culture. In fact, uh, there's estimates that brewing in England has gone back for almost uh, uh, a thousand years. Uh, so it's been around for quite a while uh, in England. And, and beer is a big part of the culture there uh, throughout uh, medieval times and up into the 18th century. Uh, famous English beer drinkers include Falstaff, uh, Shakespeare's character, uh, who's an uh, uh, early uh, advocate of ales uh, and malted beverages uh, in medieval times. Uh, in the 18th century, we have our own sort of English beer drinking mascot, uh, a gentleman they called Toby Philpot. Uh, Toby is a very jovial fellow. He's always pictured with a foaming mug of beer and a pipe uh, and is uh, uh, sort of the representation of all the joy that and nutrition that English folks will get from beer uh, as part of their everyday lives. Toby's image shows up on uh, prints, it shows up on mugs, it shows up on puzzle jugs and various other forms in 18th century England uh, and everybody would sort of recognize him as uh, the Uncle Sam of English beer drinkers. Uh, a great depiction of the importance of beer in English culture uh, is a series of prints that were done by a man named William Hogarth in the 1750s. Uh, in 1750, he published two prints, Beer Street and Gin Lane. Beer Street shows us the importance of beer in English culture. Everybody in it is happy and healthy, uh, prosperous, hardworking, uh, very... Uh, bright future uh, for England drinking beer. Uh, if you were to see Gin Lane, you would see uh, uh, the exact opposite of that. The economy collapsing, sickly looking people stumbling around, uh, clear that distilled spirits uh, are considered a little more dangerous than fermented beverages like beer in the 18th century. Uh, during our time period, beer is starting going through an important transition. In the 17th century in England, most beer was made at home by housewives. Brewing is a, a skill that most wives and uh, families would employ at home. They'd brew in the spring and fall to make enough beer uh, to supply their household needs for the rest of the year. Uh, so it was also often done on a small scale uh, and mainly done by women. Most brewers were mom 200 years ago. Beer starts with malted grains. Uh, the basis of beer is grain that has been gone through a process, a special process known as malting. This is a process of sprouting the grain, uh, and as the grain begins to, to start to grow, uh, it is put out on the floor uh, and spread out to grow for a little bit, and then it's all gonna be gathered up and put into a kiln. This is, the drying of the malt is a very important step of the process. The kiln will be fired by a fire down in the below in the little uh, fire box there, and then the grain will be placed on the flat tiles up at the top of, of the kiln uh, and will be toasted slowly. The longer the grain spends in the kiln, the higher the temperature of the kiln, 
the darker the grain's going to get. You can think of it as almost like roasting a coffee bean. You can go from a blonde roast to an espresso roast uh, and anywhere in between. Once we've decided which grains we're going to use to make our beer, we're going to crush them lightly in a mill, uh, and they're going to be uh, added to hot water to start the brewing process. We start our brewing process here uh, by heating water first. We'll take that boiling water and we'll run it through the tubs uh, that we're going to mash in uh, for a couple of reasons. One, this is going to help to hopefully wipe out any bacteria that might be harbored in the wood there. Uh, help us to start with a clean slate uh, so that we don't end up with uh, infections or uh, spoilage of our beer. Uh, the second reason for pouring the boiling hot water into the tubs is going to be to give uh, a little heat to the tubs so that we lose less heat when we add our grain. You can see we put that grain into the water, we stir it all up, and we let it sit. This process is called mashing by brewers, and it's the beginning step of the brewing process. Uh, inside here is a microbiological party going on. These grains are soaking in hot water. Meantime, enzymes are beginning to break down long protein strands into simple sugars that the yeast can eat. So we're going to let that grain mash for at least an hour for our first mash to make the strong beer, and then we're going to strain all that liquid off from the grain. So we do that a number of ways in the 18th century. Our simplest answer is, uh, is to have a brass screen on the bottom of a tub, uh, which we simply pour the grain and water mixture through, leaving behind the grain and separating out the wort or the liquid as we know it. Uh, this could also be done with a false bottom in the bottom of your brew tub, and that's the case in many larger breweries in the 18th century. Uh, that will act to strain the grains, or in very simple versions of this method, uh, we'll simply have a hole drilled in the bottom of the tub and a stick, which we move to allow the liquid to flow out. Once that grain is liquid has been strained, the wort as it's known, it's going to be boiled for quite a while uh, with the hops. The hops are an important flavor compound in the beer. Uh, they're going to do a lot of work to help preserve it as well. We'll boil the hops in that liquid for at least an hour, sometimes as many as three hours, and then we'll strain all those hops out and cool all that liquid down to put in our yeast. The yeast does the hard work for us. It takes the sugar from the grain and turns it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's what actually makes it beer. Uh, prior to this point in the process, you could drink that entire tub and not feel a thing. There's not a speck of alcohol in it. The alcohol only comes at the end of the process when we add in uh, the yeast. Uh, we also were talking a little bit about hops. Hops are an important addition to beer because they help to flavor the beer, balance out the sweetness we get from the grains uh, a little bit. Uh, we've got some hops here, uh, and we're going to be uh, showing those uh, to you as part of the, the process here. The hop is just a, a little tiny flower cone of the female hop plant. Uh, it grows uh, very quickly as a vine at the end of the summer. Uh, that vine produces these little flowers, and it's those flowers that brewers use to flavor their beer. They have a strong bitter flavor that'll balance out some of the sweetness we're getting from the grain. Uh, and they're also going to uh, have various um, chemicals in them that help prevent microbiological infections uh, from occurring in our beer. Uh, so hops are very important in the process because they help to preserve the beer, make it last longer, and they help to alter the flavor of it a little bit uh, as well. Brewing is going through a big transition in the 18th century. It's going from being the home industry that we saw originally in the 17th century and throughout history prior to that, to becoming an industrialized product. Uh, one of English, one of the first industrial revolutions to occur in England occurs in the brewing industry. And we see this industry grow all through the 18th century into larger and larger uh, quantities, uh, and larger amounts. Uh, we will get um, that grain to, uh, as, as these things begin to change over time, we start to see there's some technology that helps to improve uh, 
uh, brewing over the period as well. One of the big technological changes in this period is the thermometer. The thermometer is very important. It helps the brewer to know exactly what temperatures uh, their mash are at, which helps them to get the most sugar they can extract from their grain. Uh, and it helps uh, in that process very greatly. Uh, in, in fact, by the 1720s, decent quality glass thermometers are readily available in English cities like London uh, and are quickly adapted by home brewers uh, because they really help you to control the process a great deal uh, and to get as much as you can from it. The other big invention in the 18th century, and technologically speaking, uh, that helps brewing is the, pro is the invention of the sacrometer, or hydrometer as we know it today. This device allows you to figure out how much alcohol is in your beer. This seems pretty simple to us today because we can read it on a lab label, but 200 years ago, uh, this is going to be much more uh, difficult. In fact, prior to the 18th century, nobody knew how much alcohol was actually in their beer. Uh, and they taxed beer based on the amount of malt that was used rather than on the alcoholic strengths. When the hydrometer comes along, it changes the whole tax process. This is very important uh, for brewers and for the English crown because the English crown at one point got about a third of its income from beer taxes. Brewers are taxed in many ways. You pay a tax on hops. You pay a tax on malt. You pay a tax on the fuel used to cook all this stuff. And you pay a tax on the finished beer product. Uh, so there's a great deal of money coming into the English government in the form of beer taxes. Uh, and as the industry begins to expand and spread and industrialize, that money just keeps going up, um, becomes an even more important economic stream uh, for the crown. Uh, so we'll see that uh, through the 18th century, especially through the use of a beer called Porter, uh, we start to see the development of uh, larger scale uh, breweries. Uh, brewing goes from simple home brewing kind of a situation to brewing hundreds and hundreds of gallons at a time. Uh, and in fact, uh, large companies develop as Porter Brewers, some of which are still in business today in England. Whitbread's Brewing Company got its start as a Porter Brewer in the 18th century. Uh, so this is going to be a, a part of the trade that, that will last and linger. Uh, so we find that uh, as brewing grows from a home industry into an a, a industrial uh, process, uh, things are going to get scaled up more and more and larger and larger. And one of the issues, especially in the case of the porter brewers, is how to store all this liquid uh, for later use. Uh, porter brewers discovered that if they aged their beer for about two years, uh, that they could then blend that in with fresh and get exactly the flavor uh, that they were looking for in the beer. So they had to come up with ways of keeping large quantities of beers in storage. Uh, and you can see here in this print, uh, a picture of the storage facility at Barclay Perkins, one of the big 18th century porter brewers. Um, in fact, in case of these large wooden tons that hold porter, uh, they get bigger and bigger throughout the period. Uh, there's one case where a dinner for 200 people was held inside the, the porter ton before it was filled with beer. Uh, to age. So these get larger and larger. Uh, in fact, it becomes somewhat of a contest amongst brewers to see who could build the largest porter container. This contest ends in tragedy in 1814 uh, when the hoops on one of these uh, giant beer containers uh, began to give out and the containers collapsed. Uh, this uh, actually resulted in a very large flood of beer, uh, knocked out uh, a couple of the huge porter vats, the wall of the brewery, and drowned eight people in a sea of porter. Uh, so uh, after that, the porter brewers decided maybe building ever larger wooden containers might not be the best way to age this beer. Uh, and they start to come up with other alternatives uh, for that process. Uh, but we do find that... Um, uh, aging is a very important part of that porter industry, and, and, and because of that, it encourages larger scale operation. A small guy who only has a couple of casks can't afford to age beer for two years. He won't have any beer to sell. It's only the big guys who have lots and lots of cask space 
who can afford to age beer for two years before they sell it. Uh, and so uh, the porter industry sort of builds on itself as the technology changes and helps increase their volume and production of beer. Uh, we also start to see uh, a better understanding of, of how to store uh, that beer for later. Here in Virginia, however, uh, local brewing is not going to really be um, very industrial. There are a few commercial brewers here in Virginia, but none of them are extremely successful. And because of our climate and our location, uh, we tend to find that commercial brewing is, is really more successful up in New England than it is here in the South or in Virginia during the 18th century. Uh, so for us, beer remains a home-brewed beverage for the most part. Uh, in this period, and it's something that you're going to do in your home and make yourself, uh, provided you have the ingredients. That's one of the issues Virginia had, is because of our climate, barley does not grow very well here. Barley is normally the grain chosen uh, to be made into malt and to make beer from. Uh, but in 18th century Virginia, we are growing lots of wheat, and many Virginians uh, switched over to wheat as their primary um, ingredient for brewing. Uh, Mr. Jefferson up at Monticello, uh, Mr. Landing Carter, a plantation owner on the northern neck. Uh, these folks are all making wheat beers in the 18th century rather than beer from barley because it's much more available. Uh, and then when the revolution comes along and, and trade with England is cut off, um, we're going to find any substitute we can. When malt be lacking, we will make beer from any number of other things. Uh, available in the 18th century. Uh, the most common of those was molasses. Molasses is very affordable, very cheap, and readily available in 18th century Virginia. Uh, and many people use this to make a beer. There are a couple of reasons for doing this. One, it is, uh, as I say, cheap uh, and easy to produce. The second is, is time. The full brewing process using grain is going to take a, quite a long time. Uh, actually about 16 hours to make three separate batches of beer. Uh, and since most brewing is done at home by housewives, uh, they probably are looking for a shortcut rather than wanting to spend 16 hours in a row making beer. Uh, molasses beer is very quick to produce. You simply take the molasses, wheat bran, and some hops, boil that all together for uh, about an hour, strain the stuff out, and cool it down and ferment. Uh, so making a batch of molasses beer is about an hour's worth of work compared to making three batches of grain beer, uh, which will take you more like 16 to 20 hours worth of work. Uh, since most brewing is done by mom, I think mom's going to decide for the hour-long beer rather than the 16-hour-long brew. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to molasses, we're using a wide variety of other ingredients uh, to make beers in the 18th century, especially as we run out of imported sugars. Uh, we might make our own sugars from corn stalks. Landon Carter published a recipe in the Virginia Gazette, our local newspaper in 1775, on how to make beer from green corn stalks. Uh, I've actually attempted this once. I, I was not successful. I think maybe my corn stalks were green enough, uh, but uh, that is a, a process that he describes in, in a letter to the local newspaper. He also talks about making a molasses beer from pumpkins as well as corn stalks. Uh, so there's another version of uh, a local products that could be made into beer at the time. Uh, a third one, one we don't see very often as much today, is the persimmon. Persimmons, technically these are really a wine, but persimmon beer uh, was very commonly uh, used amongst African Americans. And in fact, there's some evidence that African American families here in the South continue to make persimmon beer well into the 20th century. Uh, typically they would combine the persimmons, uh, some locust honey pods, and some hot water, uh, and boil all that together, uh, strain everything through straw, and ferment it. Uh, and that would be used to make your natural persimmon beers. Uh, pretty low in alcohol, these beers are going to be kind of uh, light and refreshing uh, for folks in this period. So we're also going to find that uh, in addition to making beer from various other ingredients uh, at the time, um, there's going to be a lot of, of beer uh, that's produced at, at home, uh, also a lot of cider, and distilled spirits are also being made here in Virginia, in particular uh, apple and pear brandies uh, we find being uh, 
uh, very commonly distilled in uh, Virginia in this period. So we've gotten ourselves uh, a little bit of a discussion about the brewing process itself and how that work is done, uh, and a little bit about beer and how important it was to uh, people in the 18th century. Uh, we're going to go ahead at this point and, and talk just a little bit about um, um, more details about the beer and brewing. We've been doing this program at Colonial Williamsburg in the spring and fall. We have our program of the Arts and Mysteries of Brewing, uh, which we do four times in the spring and four times in the fall. Uh, and that is a batch of beer from start to finish uh, for folks to see the process in person. Uh, come by on Halloween night, we'll be doing, uh, or Halloween day, we'll be doing our brewing. Uh, and we have another one on the 27th of November uh, as well. So a couple of those brewing programs coming up. Uh, in addition to this, we've also worked with Aleworks Brewing Company here in Williamsburg to produce some of these beers uh, from the 18th century recipes so that our modern guests can have a chance to taste some of the uh, flavors and, and things, uh, beers of the past there. Uh, the first of those is, was Old Stitch. Uh, we created that beer in 2010 with Aleworks, uh, and it's a representation of a particular style of brown ale that was popular in the 18th century. In fact, Old Stitch is slang for the devil. Uh, so it's going to be a, a stronger version of a brown ale uh, than uh, normally made at that time. Uh, and uh, we have a dear old mum, a German style of beer that comes from uh, Germany in the 1500s, uh, oat, wheat, and spice beer, very light and refreshing kind of beer. Uh, and then we have four other beers uh, that we make on a seasonal basis with Aleworks. Uh, so if you want to try uh, to taste some of the beers that I'm talking about here in today's program, you're going to have to come and see us at Colonial Williamsburg. This is the only place you're going to be able to find those special beers brewed for us by Aleworks. They're in all our taverns and stores here in town uh, and get a real chance to taste uh, those beverages for yourself. You may want to do that uh, next November when we have our full in-person Ales Through the Ages conference. This November, starting on the 13th of November, we're going to be doing a uh, virtual uh, online version of Ales Through the Ages, where we're going to be exploring English ale brewing uh, from Roman times with Professor Travis Rupp uh, from the University of Boulder, who's going to be talking about Roman brewing in Britain. Uh, we have food historian Mark Meltonville uh, going to be talking about Tudor brewing uh, throughout that period. And then I'm going to be on a panel discussion with Lee Graves, a Richmond beer writer, and Tara Noren, a author who's just come out with a book on women's roles in brewing. And we're going to do a deep dive into brewing in 18th century Virginia. We're also going to have special guests from Ohio Brewery, uh, uh, the New Dayton Brewing Project out in New Clarion Brewing out in Ohio. Uh, they're going to be making an 1850s beer. So we'll get to see how beer progressed uh, from Roman times to, to modern times uh, on our program. And that's all going to be online. So we're going to go over now to start taking some questions uh, from you folks. Uh, what are you curious about beer? And what would you like to know about it? Frank, thank you so much. Um, like one of the, the things that comes up a lot of times when people discuss beer in the 18th century is you'll hear, uh, well, it was safer to drink beer than water. Is that, is that all myth, or is there some truth in that? Where does that come from? It, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, contradiction there. Uh, I, I think that um, what you see is there's some truth to that, but it's, it's really been put together in, in a way that makes it not really true. Uh, so 18th century people view beer as healthy and nutritious. Uh, that is because beer has calories. You don't get a gut like this from drinking water. Uh, that comes from beer. Uh, and so, in their mind, something that fattens you up must be nutritious because it provides those important calories to you. Uh, so, they drank beer not because it was safer, but in their mind because it was healthier than water. Healthier because it provides calories, provides you energy, provides all those uh, lovely vitamins. Beer yeast actually has a wonderful source of vitamin B12 uh, and other vitamins as well. Uh, and so these things 
are, are nutritional things that they viewed as being healthier than drinking just plain water, which uh, doesn't really seem to do anything for you 200 years ago. Now, a couple of things to understand. Beer has never been free. It's always cost money. Water, however, generally was free in the 18th century and readily available. The other thing to understand is that 18th century people are very sophisticated about water. They understand that different water sources have different levels of safety. Drinking water from a well in a city like London or Philadelphia or even Williamsburg 200 years ago uh, could be a slightly risky proposition. That's how cholera epidemics get started and many other health issues can be associated with bad well water in large cities. Uh, due to poor sanitation and sewage treatment, those things tend to get infected. Whereas spring water is very healthy and safe to drink, uh, almost always. Water captured in barrels from rain is usually also healthy and safe to drink. And so people sort of understood that the source of your water was just as important uh, as, as whether or not it was turned into beer or not in terms of health. And in fact, mineral waters become very trendy in the 18th century. Uh, right here at the governor's palace, uh, listed on the inventory of one of the governors, is 11 dozen bottles of Hatwell water, a spring mineral spring in England uh, that was drunk for health reasons. Uh, so water could even be considered healthy in the 18th century, especially spring waters and mineral waters. Uh, so it wasn't that water couldn't be safe, it's that it sometimes wasn't. Uh, but beer, with its nutrition, uh, is going to be healthy for you than water. And, and frankly, it's a lot more fun than water, too. I'm sure a lot of times when people think about the idea of beer is safer than water or something, that, that, that notion, they start to imagine seven-year-olds uh, slurring their, their ABCs and stumbling down the street. Is, is there a, a drinking age in the 18th century? No, there is not. Uh, and in fact, uh, small children, five, six, seven years of age, might well have drunk a watered-down version of small beer. Uh, so hopefully there's not going to be much alcohol in it by the time they get it. Uh, but it's really just more for that nutritional value. Uh, and as a good parent, you want to make sure your child is not stumbling around town drunk. It's going to reflect poorly upon you. Uh, so we're going to see that, uh, that parents are sort of overseeing their children's alcohol consumption and making sure that they're, they're not drinking too much. But their attitudes towards alcohol are very different from ours. Uh, and so we don't see that necessity, that, that idea that only adults can drink. Uh, kids are, are drinking beer mo in moderation uh, really throughout their lives. You mentioned their understanding of water and safety. One of the, the, well, the first step you talked about in your brewing process was sterilizing things with that boiling water. How aware were they? I mean, most of us today think of that as a later development. It, it, it is, I'm sorry. I, I probably shouldn't have used the word sterilize. I was thinking as a modern brewer. They do not have a concept of sterile in the 18th century. That's, uh, that's yet to come. Uh, but they did understand that uh, boiling water did a great job of cleaning uh, out your tubs. And they talk about the importance of scrubbing all of your tubs with boiling water and leaving them to dry in the sun or placing them next to a fire to dry. Uh, these things have the effect of, of actually sterilizing or, well, helping to sterilize. There's really no way to easily sterilize wood because of its porous nature. Uh, it can harbor all sorts of things for very long time, uh, but uh, it can at least cut down on some of the uh, infections that might occur in, in the beers. I should point out something. When, when a brewer uses the term infection, we're talking about something that is going to make the beer taste bad or act weird, uh, foam up or things like that. It is, there is nothing that can kill you that can live in beer. Uh, so when a, beer say, a brewer says in, a beer is infected, it doesn't mean people are going to get sick and die from it. It simply means that it's going to taste horrible. Usually sour flavors and things like that are the result of many of these infections in the period. So it kind of probably ultimately related to this issue too. Tina was curious about how beer was, would have been stored in Williamsburg given the heat of summer and so forth. In a cellar. You always want to keep your beer in cellar storage uh, 
uh, in this time period. That's very important. Now, it could be stored in one of two containers. Large quantities of beer are going to be shipped over from England in wooden barrels. And wooden barrels are great for shipping beer, but not so great for dispensing it. Uh, in fact, a wooden barrel cannot handle the pressure necessary to carbonate the beer. Uh, so if you want your beer to last longer and you want to be able to carbonate that beer, you want to put it into a glass bottle. The only thing is glass bottles and the corks to seal them are additional costs. And some brewers are willing to spend that extra money and others are not. We do know Mr. Jefferson there at Monticello's every year sent his servants down to Richmond to buy fresh bottles and fresh corks uh, so that he could bottle up his beer because he realized that it does survive much better in the bottle than it does in the wooden keg. And if you look at any of the taverns around town here in Williamsburg and you look at the inventories, the basement is almost always full of empty casks and empty bottles. So what that tells me is that the beer was shipped over from England in the wooden barrel uh, much easier to ship it in the barrel, uh, but it's much easier to serve it in a bottle. And so what these tavern owners were doing were transferring that beer from the uh, wooden casks into glass bottles. Uh, also keep in mind that as a tavern keeper, you have to dispense beer in legally measured quantities. So another reason for bottling is that they can get the exact legal measurement that they need to uh, uh, match their licensing requirements. Each tavern owner has to have a license. They have to renew it every year. Uh, and the city government, just like the English government back home, is making a lot of money from tavern taxes and beer taxes uh, here in America, too. Susie was curious about hops. Are colonial Americans growing their own hops? And then she knows there's a, a, there are many varieties of hops. Would folks then have had a choice of, of what kinds of hops they're using? They, they would, absolutely. In fact, hop growing in Virginia started as early as the 1620s with English varieties being brought over and starting to be grown here in Virginia before the pilgrims ever arrived in Massachusetts. Uh, we also find uh, that the hops are going to be uh, used. Um, they're, they're really part of, uh, there are natural varieties of hops, native varieties of hops, I should say, here in America as well. And what ends up happening is we start to crossbreed the English and the native varieties of hops uh, together so that uh, we start to find that um, we have new varieties of hops by this period. Now, today, hops are typically developed in a, uh, uh, a lab. The USDA does a great deal of uh, hop development uh, through their program uh, where they develop these hops in, in, a, in a laboratory for specific flavors uh, the 18th century was all up to nature and what could be uh, crossbred themselves. Uh, they do name some varieties of hops, but they're not as universally well named as today. The hop plant is, is a perennial. It keeps growing, uh, comes back every year for about 40 or 50 years. Once you get these rhizomes planted, you will get a crop every year uh, of hops. And in fact, in the spring, when the plant is just sprouting out of the ground, you can eat the little shoots, much like asparagus. Uh, as a vegetable. Uh, and our 18th century cookbooks contain a, a couple of different recipes for cooking hop shoots uh, to eat as a, uh, as a vegetable type of thing as well. Speaking of recipes, Deb was wondering if each family would have had their own recipes or if there were just you know, a handful of published recipes that people were following. That's a very good question. Uh, and since many of these things are being done by mom at home uh, in our brewing here in Virginia, she may well choose to pass on the, her beer recipe to her children. Uh, and in fact, we have in our collections here at Colonial Williamsburg uh, a wonderful, what we call commonplace book, which is a series of recipes passed from one generation to the next. It actually has three generations of the Powell family uh, who uh, contributed to this commonplace books. And you get to see uh, how the recipes change a little bit over time, how they start to become more American uh, by using corn and other native natural American ingredients in them. Uh, and so, yeah, mom might well have passed down uh, her recipes to the rest of her family um, as part of that process in the, in the form like that. I've got the recipes that I work with from 18th century brewing manual. 
Now, this presented me with a problem. These brewing manuals were written for professional brewers, basically, not home brewers. I was working with about a 10-gallon to 15-gallon system. Uh, they're making between two to 400 gallons of beer at a time. So although I had all these wonderful beer recipes from the 18th century, uh, I did not, I had to scale them down because I did not have the equipment in the setup uh, short of a, a major investment in, in rebuilding an 18th century brewery uh, to actually follow the recipes as they were written. Uh, and I discovered when I started doing this that uh, there's been a big improvement in the quality of grain over the last 200 years. Uh, I discovered this by actually figuring out uh, and reducing the recipe down to 10 gallons. Uh, and then I made my first batch of beer after I did all the math and figured it all out. And that beer came out at about 14.5% alcohol. Certainly people aren't drinking this stuff all day and working and uh, drinking a gallon or so of beer uh, throughout the day of, of beer of that strength. Uh, they'd have a hard time functioning. So what we find is that um, uh, probably... Over the last 200 years, we basically doubled the uh, protein and, and sugars available in our grains uh, in that period of time. So we've made much better grain uh, over the last 200 years. And that was part of the process that I then had to go to was to figure out, okay, so how strong was their beer? And really, until the sacrometer comes along, the hydrometer, we didn't know that. Uh, and one of the great things about Richardson's treatise on the sacrometer in this period is it gives measurements for all these beers that he brewed as tests uh, for it. Uh, and the sacrometer there uh, is, is set up with a scale. The problem for me as a modern beer historian was that nobody uses that old scale anymore. So I had a wonderful source that had all the information I needed to know about how strong beer was in the 18th century but I couldn't translate it because I didn't have the right mathematical formula. Well, after about 10 years of searching around, I finally found a fellow in England who, when he was trained many years ago, was trained on the old scale of brewer's pounds. And he gave me the mathematical formula to translate that into the modern scales that brewers use today. I was then able to go through Richardson's book and discover that uh, we were making our porter originally at about 8% alcohol. And by looking at his recipes, all of his porters were between six and a half and uh, six, seven uh, percent alcohol. So we actually reduced the amount of grain we put in our porter recipe so that we could bring the strength down to what Richardson was obtaining uh, with his sacrometer there. So uh, it was kind of a long process for me to, to be able to figure out just how strong these beers were and how to scale them down properly uh, because. Uh, uh, they were written originally in very large recipes and then had to be reduced for home use. You've talked quite a bit about where so many of the different ingredients come from, but not so much about yeast. And Tina wants to know, where would brewers get their yeast? In yeast? Typically, we're getting our yeast from the last batch of beer. Uh, beer is sort of self-perpetuating yeast factory. In fact, every time you make beer, you get about 10 times the yeast out of it that you put into it. So making beer is a great way of making yeast. That extra yeast you're going to use to make your bread, your cakes, any of the other things that you need yeast for uh, in terms of leavening in your household. Another reason why mom is the brewer, because uh, she can make her own yeast and use that right there uh, for baking the bread. Uh, and that yeast can be reused in, uh, a number of times. Now, as modern brewers, we will understand that yeast mutates very easily. Uh, very quickly, and eventually it's going to start changing flavors and characteristics, uh, and you may want to get an, another yeast at that point. Uh, in the 18th century, it's important to realize there is yeast in every single beer being out there, because none of these beers are filtered and pasteurized like modern beers are. So if you run out of yeast or if your yeast didn't survive from the spring to the fall for, for the next brewing, uh, what you could do is simply uh, strain off the liquid from a bottle of beer and use the yeast at the bottom of that bottle to create more for your next batch of beer. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that they can preserve that yeast from brew to brew. When the beer is fermenting, it will produce a big foam on the top. You could skim that foam off, put it into a bottle, put it down in your cellar, uh, and that can be your source of yeast for the next batch of beer that you're making. 
or you can wait until the beer has finished fermenting and all the uh, yeast has settled to the bottom, transfer the liquid off of that bottom sludge, and then press the liquid out of those uh, and make sort of beer cakes or yeast cakes uh, out of that uh, beer sludge, uh, which is primarily yeast, although there are also lots of harp, hop particles and other things in it as well. That I will point out that that yeast can add a slightly bitter flavor to your beer because of those hop particles. Uh, sometimes your beer or your breads that are leavened with, uh, with beer yeast uh, will have a very different flavor from them than leavened with modern yeast today. Deb, from Deb, we have a question. Um, if you had to compare 18th century beer to today's version, is there anything similar? Sure. There, there are many of the styles that were popular in the 18th century that are still brewed by brewers today, porter being the most important of them. Uh, porter really gets its start in about 1715, 1720 in the city of London. It spreads through London, through the entire empire. Catherine the Great of Russia was a huge fan of English porter and had it imported to Russia. Uh, it's imported to Jamaica, it's imported to Virginia, it's sent to India, uh, it's sent all over the empire uh, in a big way. And so that becomes uh, very much uh, a style that uh, 18th century people would know. Towards the end of the 18th century, Porter starts to lose popularity to a new style of beer, pale ale. Pale ales start to come in uh, and, and become more and more popular. They've been around for a while in England, going back uh, basically to medieval times as well. Uh, but uh, as English start to produce more beer and uh, start to drink beer from glasses, they start to worry more about the appearance and the color of the beer uh, than the porters. The porters and stouts are very dark and cloudy, and really most of those things you're probably going to be drinking uh, through a mug that you can't see through anyway, so it really won't matter. Uh, but as the English glass industry starts to pick up in the 18th century and you start to see ale and beer glasses, you want your beer to be clearer and more pretty to look at through those glasses. So we start to see the use of an ingredient called isinglass. Isinglass is actually derived from the air bladders of certain fish, and it's used to cause everything to settle out in your beer to help clarify it, uh, make it clearer uh, uh, beer. So we start to see brewers pick up the use of isinglass in the 18th century as a way of clarifying their beer and making it look uh, nicer and prettier, especially the pale ales, uh, you start to see uh, uh, more and more of them and towards the end of the 18th century. Uh, so those are the two big styles of beer that will still be around today that they had then. Um, but understand that brewers now are much, much cleaner than they were 200 years ago. They have the technical ability to make single strains of yeast uh, to give them much cleaner flavored beers uh, than 18th century brewers had the ability to do. Uh, and uh, also they pasteurize and sterilize their beer. So that makes them clearer and, and easier to see through and, and more pleasant looking today as well. Uh, probably in terms of accuracy, if you wanted to try a beer that tasted more like an 18th century beer, you would want to look towards the Belgian beers, the Belgian styles of beers, because they're often naturally fermented uh, using wild yeasts and will have a much more of the, the funkier kinds of flavors uh, that 18th century beers would have had uh, than a modern English Yale. I often tell people that English beer today uh, is probably, um, actually uh, in the 18th century, uh, beer was probably tasted a lot more like Belgian ale than English ale today. So uh, that's one thing that's, that's changed is uh, now we can be perfectly sterile, we can do all this in uh, zero gravity rooms some breweries use uh, to ensure that there's no uh, infections that occur in their uh, beer, um, in their beers as well. You mentioned one of the, the presentations at the upcoming Else to the Ages conference on women brewers. You've also mentioned mom brewing quite, quite a bit. Uh, were there women brewing basically professionally in the 18th century? Generally not, and, and that's because of sort of a catch-22. Uh, in, in that professional cooks and professional brewers are almost always male in this period. Men had the advantage of professional training. Uh, there were probably some exceptions in England in the period, but uh, especially as beer industrializes, what happens is it goes from being the work of women and housewives to being the work of men 
uh, in, in larger commercial situations. So it's actually during this period where we see the transition uh, from mom the brewer and housewife to the professional male brewer. Uh, and men have so fully taken over this industry in just the 200 year period uh, that now women are only maybe 10 to 20 percent of America's uh, professional brewers today uh, are women. So uh, it's something that uh, uh, ladies, don't let the men have all the fun. Uh, you can brew beer too. Uh, it's just as fun for you as it is for the guys. Uh, and certainly, uh, historically speaking, uh, Beer was always made by women uh, from ancient Egypt and ancient Sumeria on up to the 17th century in England. We have time for one last question, Frank. Um, we know you've got the Ales for the Ages conference coming up, and we know that you've been experimenting with 18th century brewing techniques and recipes for a long time. What's next? Do you, do you have other, other, other areas that you'd like to try or experiment with? Um, Actually, the, the first part of the brewing process is something I would really like to do, and that's making malt. Uh, that's often a separate trade in the 18th, 18th century. You could be a maltster or you could be a brewer. Uh, maltsters make malt, brewers make beer. Uh, and so learning how to kill malt in a proper 18th century manner, I think would be a very interesting project to take on. Uh, the only problem is I have to get a malt kiln. Uh, and so that will involve uh, bringing in some of my fellow historic tradesmen here at Colonial Williamsburg uh, to help us figure out the construction of that. Uh, and get some funding together for a project where we can actually make our own malt. I think that would be a lot of fun to do. Uh, and then a somewhat related trade, uh, eventually I'd love to be able to start distilling uh, and, and working with some of the distilled spirits that 18th century Virginians had as well. Uh, so those are things that we hope to do in the future uh, as part of all this process. Thank you so much, Frank, for sharing all that with us today. I'm, I'm sure everyone would want you to share something to drink with us, but we understand that that's not possible given the technology. This program and this project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And as always, this program was made possible through the generosity of our donors. Thank you all. To learn how you can contribute, please follow the link pinned to the comments below or visit us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Frank, do you have any final thoughts for us today? I hope I've piqued your interest in 18th century beer and brewing. I'm glad you joined me for the program here. And if, if you're further interested, please uh, join us for the online program, Ale Through the Ages, in November, and join us in person for the real uh, conference uh, in November of 2022. Uh, we're going to have about 30 historic beer scholars uh, wonderful beer tastings, uh, great lectures, uh, and even some workshops uh, for people to get involved in uh, beer history and the process of brewing over time.